Hello and welcome to Funk Prog Sweden 9. We are back with another live stream. Um, today we'll have two presentations. Uh, first presentations from Leonardo and the second presentation from Brucio. Let's go to the agenda. So, first a short intro by me uh, and then we get the presentation. Transferring the system modular code base to OCaml by Leonardo Laguna Ruiz. Uh, and then we have Erlang Oddities by Brucio Benavides. Uh, and then in the end I'll do a short, uh, where are we? How many meetings, meetups are left of the year, etc. A schedule and summary of this meetup. First up, we would like to thank our video sponsor, Adabit. Adabit is a small IT consulting company based in Stockholm, Sweden, where most of the developers have a background in functional programming. If you want to know more about Adabit, please check them out in social media or on adabit.com. Uh, and of course, you want to support the Funk Prog Sweden community then what you sh can you do? You can join the Meetup community, of course, and you can subscribe to the Funk Prog Sweden channel. And if you really like Funk Prog the Meetup and the YouTube channel, please head over to and check out the merchandise store where you can get a coffee cup with the Funk Prog Sweden logo type on. If you get any questions during the presentation, uh, please use the YouTube chat and I will read it out to the presenter so they can hear it and everyone else can hear it and you can see it and they can answer it, hopefully. So, uh, with that said, let's get started with the first presentation. Uh, welcome to Funk Prog Sweden, Bruce Leonardo. Hello, hello. Hello, warm welcome. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, you're warm. it's uh, really nice that you can come and really nice that we find more people that are doing OCaml. So the stage is all yours. Okay, let me start. So, yeah, in this presentation, uh, I'm going to show you our journey into OCaml. And, uh, but a little bit about me. So uh, I'm Leonardo Laguna Riz. I'm originally from Mexico and I work at Wolfram uh, MathCore, which is a subsidiary of Wolfram Research. And Wolfram MathCore is, is located in Sweden. And we develop uh, this, uh, the, the modeling uh, part of, uh, of the Wolfram, which is system modeler. And there's a little bit more about me. So I'm, I'm an electrical engineer. I, I studied a PhD in electrical engineer. And I started programming as, as many of, of people my age. When I was a teenager, I got interested into, into programming. And I, I also like uh, music and synthesizers, specifically DSP. So back in the day when I, when I was a teenager, uh, I was uh, doing C++, assembly for DSPs, and programs for the HP calculator. And at some point in my life, I was working on a project uh, during my PhD thesis, and it was a it was a C sharp project, and I and I needed to, to create like a text box in which the the user could input a formula, and I needed to evaluate that formula. And when I started uh, checking how I could do that in C sharp, uh, so I was looking for a a lexer, a parser and writing some kind of, of evaluator to, to be able to uh, evaluate this expression. And I found uh, this programming language called F-sharp, and there was an example. I, I, unfortunately, unfortunately, I couldn't find the, the exact post, but it was something like this. It was basically what I needed to do. It was writing a, a lexer, a parser, and an evaluator and everything and the code was super super short and super elegant so it was it was really really interesting for me and that was the point where i got hooked into, into functional programming and following this my evaluator ended up being 
about 100 lines of, of F-sharp code. And since then, I, I started uh, programming F-sharp. And every project that I, that I had to do, personal or professional, was done in F-sharp. So it was like about uh, five years. And during that period, I, I developed a model compiler, a simulator, and an optimization engine, which was all part of my PhD thesis. And also during that time, I, I started learning other, uh, or not, uh, other functional languages like Haskell, Lisp, and OCaml, but I was mainly focused on, on F Sharp. Okay, so this is the outline of my presentation. First, I'm going to show you a little bit of the architecture of System Modeler. That way you can, you can have an idea on, on which parts we are doing functional, specifically with OCaml. But in, or, in order to, for you to understand the, this transition, I need to, to explain you the historical context of our code base. And then I'm, I'm going to, to jump into the process that we, that we did to select the, the programming language that we were going to move. And finally, how we, how we move the data, the, the code base into OCaml. So if you, if you haven't heard about System Modeler, it is basically uh, an environment in which you can create uh, multi-domain simulation models. So you have uh, like this GUI where you can just drag and drop components and connect components in order to create complex simulation models. And underneath this System Modeler, there is a, a programming language called Modelica, which is a, it's a, it's a domain-specific language that simplifies uh, the creation of these models that have on underneath uh, differential equations. And one of the great things about Wolfram System Modeler is that it perfectly integrates with the Wolfram language or Mathematica, and that uh, allows you to do like lots of complex analysis. So some of the applications uh, of, of System Modeler will be uh, this, this modeling simulation of electrical circuits and also combine electrical, hydraulic, uh, mechanical, thermal, bi biological. So basically anything that you can express with differential equations can be, can be mo uh, modeled and simulated with System Modeler. And I also use it for my personal applications, which I, I like to model uh, sound synthesizers. And I have a few blog posts about uh, how, how uh, like the whole process that I do in order to get to go from a, from a circuit to a, a very simple algorithm that can run in real time and you can use for music production. Okay, so this is the, the architecture of System Modeler. It consists of uh, this part, central part that we call the kernel which is the, the model compiler. It is also kind of interpreter and it provides all like a bunch of services. And this kernel it communicates with all, all these clients. So our clients will be model center, which is the, the graphical environment in which you create your models. And, you, and when you, and you can also do the textual model creation, et cetera. And then another client that we have is Simulation Center, which is, is, is the program where you can uh, control your simulations, uh, plot equations, and do the, the common uh, analysis. And the third client that we have is, is the Wolfram language itself, which allows you to do scripting and model creation and also uh, more advanced analysis. And the part that, that we moved to OCaml, it was, it was the kernel. The, the rest of the, the parts are uh, model, the, for example, model center, simulation center, and parts of uh, the GUI of the Wolfram language are written in C++. But the core uh, compiler is, is nowadays written in OCaml. But it wasn't always like this. So this is a little bit of the history of, uh, of System Modeler, it, which it was originally called Math Modelica. And it was uh, created by a company founded around uh, 1998 by uh, Mathcore Engineering based in Linköping, Sweden. 
and they had uh, uh, around 99 they had an initial version which was written in Mathematica or nowadays called the Wolfram language but the the program as we know it uh, with this uh, model creation com uh, kernel compiler etc uh, the first version was released in 2006 and another in, uh, important point in the history is that around 2007, another project started, uh, in which, which was uh, started by, by some people uh, from Linshopin University, which, which was also involved into, into MathCore. And it was this uh, Open Modelica, which was basically an open source alternative to what Mat Modelica was providing for professional use. And then the next, we, we have around 2000, 2008, um, the company Wolfram Matcore was acquired by, uh, sorry, the, the company Matcore was acquired by Wolfram and it became Wolfram Matcore. And this was the year as well when, when I joined the company. In 2011, it was the first, the first uh, year in which we have uh, a release of uh, a Wolfram System Modeler, just uh, like the rebranded version of it. So basically, okay, this is uh, a little bit about the the development history of the kernel, which is this our compiler. So uh, around 1995, uh, some people from Lynch Open University developed this this language called RML. A relational meta language, which was a little bit like SML, uh, with some some ex expanded features. And the reason why this is important is this because around 2000, 2005, a new project, a new programming language called Metamodelica, was uh, released, and that one used the core compiler of uh, RML and also the code generator. And the idea with this Metamodelica uh, language, it was to create a language that was like Modelica, like the language that we use for modeling uh, dynamic systems, but extended and turning it into a general purpose language. And System Modeler and also Open Modelica, the kernel parts were written in this language, Metamodelica. And this language look a little bit like this, this is how uh, you will define a type. And what I have here is just a, a type, an expression type that can have different representations. It can be a number that has a floating point inside. It can be a variable, which, is, which has a string. And in this case, I have uh, an operation, which will be a sum. And we have two, two expressions as uh, inside of it. So, Metamodelica had some good parts, and this is where I'm going to show you next. Uh, so basically the types were ML style as, uh, as I showed before. That's the way you, uh, that you define the types. And it had uh, features like pattern matching, uh, first class functions, and it was also portable because it was possible uh, to take uh, the Metamodelica code turn it into C. And once you have it in uh, a C code, it can be just compiled uh, in any platform that you, that you want. This is how it look. Uh, this is a function. Uh, it, this is an, an evaluator function uh, uh, for the data type that I described before. So we can see that, that I, have, I have to, in, in order to declare a function, you need to type function, and then you need to, de to declare every input and every output. To, to your function, and then we have this match where we are, are going to to, uh, to to take our, our expression and, and return uh, uh, the internal value. So then we need to declare all the variables that we are going to use locally, and this is our first case. So when we get a number, we just return the floating point value. When we get a sum, we take these two sub nodes here and apply recursively the evaluation function, and then we just sum them and return the value. 
and something interesting here. So when we when we get a variable, uh, we have this other function that is a lookup in, in that is just going to check that main into uh, some table of definitions. And the last case we have it here, because if something fails, for example, the lookup here, if it fails, this, uh, this, this construct that was widely used in Metamodelica called the match continue, is, uh, will, will behave as uh, if the lookup fail, it will continue to the next case. And if it matches, it's going to execute that one. In this case, we are going to print an error and then just return a failure that will be propagated to, to the caller of, of, the, of the function. Mm. So, okay, those, those were the good parts, some of the bad parts. Uh, first one, the language was quite verbose. So in order to create a function, you, knew, you need to, to do, uh, I mean, to declare everything, declare all, all types, uh, direction of the variables, uh, all the local variables that you were using. And well, then, I mean, this is verbose compared to most functional languages, right? And the next disadvantage that, that we had, it, it was the performance. It was not very fast. It didn't execute very fast, and it was also slow to compile. And some of the limitations that it had, it was uh, for, for being a kind of functional language. There were no anonymous functions, no closures, and no if expressions. So if you wanted to do like a list map in a functional style, you will have to create a, another function and then pass all the arguments. And the process of creating this new function, uh, it was a little bit tedious because you need to type the name of the function, declare all local variables to the matching. So you have to do everything. The next disadvantage it was that uh, we had only print the bug so when we when we were trying to find uh, an, an error in, in the in the code, you will add some print statements. Then you recompile, which is a slow process. Then you run, and then you find your error. So the next thing that was quite a, a challenge it was the error handling, and there were also some bugs. Okay, in the case of the error handling, I have this this small function which is, it takes an integer number and it outputs an integer. And we're going to jump into this match continue. So if the, the input number is a zero, we're going to execute this function that can fail and then return zero. If the input is, it's a number one, we're going to return the number one. And if it is any other, any other integer, we're going to print this error that, that the input is not zero or one. And, and we're going to fail. So uh, as, as in the case that, that I showed before, when we reach this, this function that can fail, what's going to happen uh, is, is that it's going to jump to the next case and jump to the next case. So for example, I input a, a zero number, but for some reasons, for some other unrelated bug, this function fails, uh, what we get is that uh, we're going to fall into the default case. We're going to get this error. The input is not zero or one. And we're, we're going to continue propagating this error. And this was a little bit confusing because sometimes you don't know that this function can fail. Here it is very clear because I call it like that. But sometimes your call chain, uh, there are many levels. And, you, and you, you didn't know how you ended up into this place and what, what was this error message telling you. So this was a, a little bit challenging because that was the only kind of failure that we, that we could uh, handle. Okay, now this is, I'm going to show you the, the relation between Open Modelica and System Modeler. As I told, as I told you before, uh, these projects were related. And basically, a big part of the code was shared. So, Open Modelica is this project, and it had uh, these uh, two parts: the back end and the front end. The front end being uh, the the part of the code that is that does the model parsing, the initial simplification of the model. It also had a bunch of aux auxiliary libraries and data types. 
And on the open model side, they have their backend, which is going to be the equation optimization, code generation, and also interactive, uh, interactive uh, uh, like a repo. So from in system model, we were taking this front end part, which is where, which were all those files, and then we were adding our own backend, uh, which is again our own equation optimization, code generation, etc. So, and since we were actually taking uh, the files and compiling or our project with it, it was, uh, we, had a, we had a lot of problems. For example, that the API was not stable. It was not clear uh, which, which uh, functions, which types, etc. we were using. Therefore, the, uh, when they open Modelica uh, people, for example, they, they make a, a big change, they add a new feature, and we want to take the changes. Since they didn't, since they didn't have access to our source code, they could be breaking completely a system model without knowing it, and they cannot fix it. So we had to spend a lot of time like uh, reviewing the changes that they were making and deciding which have impact, which did not have, and then, of course, running all or test and verify that everything it's it's working so it was a, a kind of tedious process and if, and even we were when we were uh, supporting open model the open model project we did not have like um, like the uh, full control on what things they were implementing so if they wanted to refactor everything or change everything uh, we could not stop them we, we just needed to adapt to anything that they were doing so the, the way we would like this to work, it was something in this style where Open Modelica splits the project into this backend and frontend. And then there is a, a, a well-defined frontend uh, with an API to which both projects, System Modeler and Open Modelica uh, could communicate uh, and, and use that way uh, we could minimize uh, the the breaking changes and, and also have like a better control on, on what's what's happening there so when when we start facing all these problems it was when we start thinking that that we needed to do like something in order to to improve our situation and the initial approach that we had uh, it was to to create like this tool, which I started, uh, it was a, an F sharp based tool uh, that had as, as a task to, uh, to parse and analyze all the open Modelica code. And from that code, uh, I could do like a cleanup of everything that we didn't need and, 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 and extract only the parts that were significant for us in, in order to obtain like this minimal open Modelica frontend. And this, this was uh, quite nice because we could uh, like filter which which part of the commits uh, didn't have any impact on us, and also we, we were getting like smaller diffs which were easier to interpret and then to adapt. So, and this and this tool was uh, was working quite quite okay. We were using it for for some time, but uh, this at this point it was when we started thinking. I mean, we have this minimal front end, and we have, uh, and we are basically just plugging our back end. So our back end could be written in any other language. We don't have to, to use uh, Metamodelica. And this is the point when we started considering uh, something like this. So we have the minimal front end still written in Metamodelica, uh, maintained by, by Open Modelica. And then we use, we define an, uh, an API and we create our backend in any programming language that, that, we, that we want. And in order to have like this stable API, uh, we could basically use only the data types. So we, we will be dropping all the, all the functions that we rely on from here. So if they make changes uh, to any function, those changes do, are not propagated to, to, our, to our side. 
And yeah, once once we have this, once we, we start with this idea of having a separate programming language, uh, the way of communicating the data, it, it could be just by serializing the data, right? And, and having like a bidirectional communication between these two, two parts of the, of the project. And how, how could we exchange the data? So basically what we needed, it was like a way of, of generating automatically, uh, of automatically generating converters. So this is, this is uh, the data representation in Metamodelica, which is the, the, same, the same thing that I, that I showed before. Just we have a number, a variable and a sum. And this is how it will look in F sharp. So it basically, uh, direct mapping. And if we wanted so, uh, to move it to something like, like C, we could represent it as this, like having a tag and then a struct uh, that has the inner elements. So as, as you can see, it, it, once you have, once you shrink everything to just data types to use as API, you can represent them in, in any language. Okay, so yeah, we started this process of picking a, a, a new programming language. And we wanted to, I mean, the language that we, that we ended up using, uh, we wanted to have as many of, of, of these features. I mean, the most, desired, the, the most desirable feature it was that uh, there should be a, a way of automatically convert the existing code base because we didn't want to, to rewrite everything from scratch. If we rewrite rewriting from scratch, it will be a, a very long and tedious process. We also wanted that the new language uh, had static types because uh, Metamodelica had stat static types, and we really enjoy uh, catching most of the errors at compile time. So, if your data structure change, uh, you can easily track all the places where this change will affect you and, and decide how you are going to how you're going to fix it. We also wanted wanted the language to have union types to represent all these complex data that we have. And of course pattern matching because we need uh, we needed an easy way of, of uh, processing all this symbolic data that we have. We want it to be functional because uh, it really simplifies the, uh, writing complex behaviors and also if if this language will be succinct it will be much better so have less code with more meaning and we wanted a debugger because print the bug sometimes is not enough and some of the bugs uh, is very useful to know how you ended up in that place we also wanted to have a uh, to, to have a language that was a little bit faster because this will be great for our users. If, if their model compiles faster, then it's good. And in, for the developers, we want it to be a language that could be fast compiled because if we, if we have to do iterations on the code, that's, that's always nice to, to not wait too much on the code to be compiled. And then, so at this point, we also started checking uh, different languages and we were thinking on, okay, let's, how, how can we compare them? Uh, so we need some benchmarks. So I found the computer language uh, benchmark game and very quickly I found out that this was not representative at all of our problem. Uh, that we, in order to, to create a, like a, a benchmark, that would be good for us. Uh, I needed to, 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 to do something that looks more like the kind of task that we solve. So uh, what kind of task do we solve is, uh, it would, sorry? Okay, uh, we, 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 we wanted to, to perform symbolic manipulation of expressions we wanted also to, to evaluate expressions uh, like store, lookup values. We also needed the common graph operations. So for, for that, I created like a, like a small program that was very easy to translate to different languages and will perform this kind of task and, and will help us to, to, to understand how the language, how we could express this 
algorithm in different languages and also test the performance. And these are the results that, that I got back then. Uh, you can see that in the y-axis, I have the time that it took to execute um, this, this benchmark. On the x, we have the, the lines of code that were used to, to write the, the program. And yeah, the first thing that we can see is that the language that we were using, Metamodelica, it took about 40 seconds to execute, and it was uh, more than 300 lines of code to, to express this algorithm. So it, was, it is quite verbose and slow. And on, down here, we have C++, which was quite fast, two, three seconds, but also required like hundreds of lines of code. And that's without counting uh, the, the STD library, right? Because there were some, some calls were used here that, uh, that simplify. On the other extreme, we have Mathematica, which uh, it took about 20 something seconds, but this, is, this language is very compact and very succinct. And it took us around 50 lines of code to, to express the same algorithm. We also tested F sharp, which was my favorite programming language back then. And you can see it was almost 20 seconds. Haskell, it's, it's laying around here, around 10 seconds, uh, a little bit over a uh, hundred lines. And then we have OCaml here, which was, it was, it looks like a very good compromise between the, the, the execution time and the, line, and the lines of code uh, that, that, we, that we generated. And we also did another another benchmark, which was uh, like a, a very similar algorithm, but using only numerical uh, computations. And since and by using numerical computations, it's but much easier to port to other languages. And these are the results. So again, the programming language that we're using it's it was the slowest and also the one that required the most uh, more lines of code. C was the fastest with also quite some lines of code. OCaml, uh, it was the same, like a very good compromise between speed and lines of code. Then we have Lua JIT and also PyPy, which I will believe is like a JIT version of Python and F Sharp, very similar to, to OCaml. So, I mean, you already know what was the winner because that's the title of this presentation. But still, I'm going to explain you the rationale behind uh, why we selected OCaml. So these are the languages that, for us, had like a very strong uh, con. The first one, even when C++ was the fastest, uh, it, it C, uh, C is quite quite a verbose language, and you have to do everything from scratch. So it it, it will be very hard for us to to automatically convert our code into C into C into C++, considering that we had to, to, to add more code for memory management, etc. So it would it wouldn't be very readable after converting converting it. We also dropped F sharp because we found that uh, back then, it was, this was around 2014, we found that F sharp was quite quite fast in, in .NET. But uh, compared to Linux and Mac, it was slow. It was running on top of Mono, and, and we didn't want that. We want something that behaves similarly because we our product uh, runs uh, in Linux, Mac, and Windows, and we wanted to, to have the same experience in all of them. Then we also dropped Haskell because uh, when we started thinking how how we had to convert our existing code base. There were some side effects, and we actually needed like a smarter uh, converter tool in order to fit into the into the Haskell uh, complete pure uh, way of writing the code. It was a, a bit challenging. So the main contenders were uh, OCaml because it it was it is quite fast, and it is also quite close to Metamodelica. So basically, we could, we could map most of the constructs directly to, to OCaml. And, and the other uh, contender it was, was Mathematica or, or the Wolfram language, because uh, 
Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a language that it is used in-house and it is very succinct. It, it also has a lot, lot of functionality. So we could have uh, deleted uh, many, many, many lines of code, but uh, it, was, it, it is also challenging to, to do an automatic translation because uh, some of the fastest ways of doing uh, something in Wolfram language uh, are, are not, we, we could map them very well to what we do in Metamodelica. So we also had this problem that making a good uh, translation uh, will be difficult. So we picked Ocam because we would have, uh, in theory, uh, a performance increase for from 5x to 10x. We will have a decent uh, reduction of the code. And the most important uh, feature it was that uh, when I was doing all these benchmarks and all these experiments with different languages, uh, uh, there was a version of OCaml that released uh, syntax extensions. And I could use this mechanism of, of extending uh, the OCAM language in order to create even, uh, to create code that was going to be very readable and that match very well uh, the, meta the Metamodelica code that we have. So in order to, to do this task, I, I created this uh, program, the Metamodelica to OCaml converter. And the basic idea it was to parse all the code and analyze all the error paths uh, in the Metamodelica code, then perform simplifications to like that code elimination, detecting unreachable code, simplifying uh, like silly code, and also uh, simplifying the match. I, I could do as well uh, simplification of the error paths. And, and the most important points was that we needed to generate code that was very readable and also being uh, very idiomatic. And we, and we wanted to preserve all the comments. So all the original comments in the Metamodelica code, we wanted to, to drag them because we had implementation details, function documentation, etc. And after experimenting with this, with this converter, this is uh, this is an example of, of what of what we got. I have this function uh, main, uh, which uh, is translated to this into OCaml. This safe call is this in OCaml and on safe call. But the important thing here is that uh, uh, the way this function will execute in Metamodelica. Uh, translated very, very nice to, to OCaml. So what I have here, I have uh, this function that takes, uh, uh, yeah, it just produces a, an output. The first thing that it does, it performs this safe call. So it's basically a function that cannot fail. Then we call this on safe call, which the way I define it, it just returns a failure and then uh, binds the output to one. And this is converted as, as this. So we have, we call the safe call, and it's just a, a let binding. And then we call the unsafe call. And what you see here is one of the extensions that, that, we, that we implemented, which is a, a monadic binding. It's basically uh, uh, this function, unsafe call, uh, could return either a success or a failure. If the function return a success, then the value is bound to be and we return the number one. So this, this was quite, quite nice because uh, if, if you take a look at this code, we can clearly see all the places where, uh, I mean, it's, it, it is the, the error handling, is, it is not hidden in the code. In this side, in this side of the code, you, you don't see at all uh, that this, function can fail, but here it is, it is very obvious because it has a percentage F. Mm -hmm. So to give you a, an example on, on how we kept improving on, on this converter in order to get what we wanted. So we have uh, this, this function is, is the same that I presented before. If you have as, if you have as input a zero, it will call this on safe call. 
a one, it will immediately return one. And we had this default case, which was an error propagation. And this was converted into this piece of OCaml. It looks pretty much like OCaml, but it, it has this special percentage continue, which is the, a syntax extension that we, that we created to replicate this behavior. So what's going to happen is, uh, specifically in this point, where the unsafe call is, is uh, performed, if this one fails, it is going to continue to the, to the next. Uh, since it doesn't match, it's going to continue to the next and it's going to, to return a failure. And once we had this, this converter, we, we could start doing the, the error uh, propagation analysis, like in this case. So this is the, exactly the same code, but we added uh, in the default case, a print statement, which this was a pattern, a pattern that we had uh, all around the code. So we have a last case that is going to report an error and then uh, propagate the failure. Since we had, uh, this was a common pattern, <coughs> we, we uh, implemented in the converter a way of, of turning this into a, an OCaml exception. So it will look like this. If you if you input any number that is not zero or one, or if this function uh, called uh, fails, it's going to fall into this one, and we're going to get an OCaml exception. So the, the that that failure propagation change is is broken, and and because we know that this function either succeeds or returns an exception, we, we consider this like a safe return function and which means that that we can prefix it with this and we can we can uh, and we don't have to to implement the, the error propagation for every call of this function and then we could start doing uh, so one, one thing that happened is that once we start seeing the the generated ocam code and all the and all the error propagation paths the, uh, it was clear for us that in many places we did not expect the code to behave that way. So we were able of jumping back to the original code, uh, fixing it, and then running the converter again. And then we can see uh, the result, which was more what we, we expected it. Uh, this one is the same code. The only change is that I turn the unsafe call into a safe call. So this function that, that, that I didn't know, uh, I fix it, so it always succeeds, and the converter automatically detected that there were there was no no error path that the, it wasn't needed any error propagation. So this this becomes a simple match. And we have this default case, which is going to throw an exception, which is uh, uh, which is an exceptional case that we need to record that we could easily recover in or not, <coughs> depending on the situation. Okay, in the next part that we needed to sort to sort out, it was the sorry. The next part that we needed to sort out, it was the the data data conversions so we have again the the metamodelica data representation which is turned into ocam like this and since we know exactly the the shape of this data we could create this uh, c this uh, c functions that will do the hunting so we could take a, a, a metamodelica value and convert it to ocaml and vice versa. So we could exchange data between the two programming languages. So, and yeah, so going back to, to our benchmark, we run the converter into this, into the original code for, of our benchmark. And this is the result that we got. So I, I have to mention that here, not all the optimizations that we implemented were, were yet ready but we could see uh, this behavior. So the Metamodelica code converted to Occam, we immediately got uh, a significant uh, 
performance improvement and also a reduction of the lines of code, which was quite good. And this code was perfectly readable. Uh, I would say that it was even more readable than the original. So yeah, and this is this is how we implemented it. We had the system modeler kernel running the original Metamodelica frontend, and we just passed in, and we had as a slave the the OCAM code, and we send the data and we just fetch back the data. And this is the result that we got. Uh, so in red we have system modeler four point two, which is uh, the version that Intel that had this combined OCAM and Metamodelica languages, and the, the other two uh, didn't have it. And these are the results of, of some of the scalability tests that we have. So these are quite large models that we can run and we can check how, how, how the code is performing. And here we have the, the, what's the performance improvement? Like in this specific model, we got 2.x of performance, 3.2 times faster, 4.8, 10 times faster in this model. And in this one, uh, the original code didn't even finish. And the, the OCAM code was finishing uh, quite fast. So it, it was a quite, it was a good improvement. And once we had the, the code in, in, in OCAM, uh, we got a bunch of things that were very useful. For example, lots of warnings in the compiler, because now we can uh, enable uh, warnings for unused variables, unused arguments to functions, uh, uncover uh, cases in, in the pattern matching in, in also redundant cases. And yeah, once we have this, we could do uh, manually a, a big cleanup of, of the source code. We also got a lot of useful libraries from the OCAM ecosystem. And very important, we got the tools, uh, IntelliSense, uh, and the one that I like the most is the, the OCAM uh, time traveling debugger, uh, which can go backwards. So sometimes the, uh, catching an error is quite, quite easy. You just run the debugger, when it fails, it will stop automatically, and then you just jump backwards, and then you know exactly the conditions that, that produce this error. There is a parser generator, and another one that I like a lot is the code for matter because we can we can all create a code uh, that is uh, very consistent. And other uh, language features which are quite nice, like the uh, things that we didn't have in in Metamodelica, like anonymous functions, covered functions, if expressions, nested pattern matching, and more advanced. Uh, things in OCAM like the functors, which are parameterized modules, uh, the strong typing and the type inference, etc. So once we, we reach uh, that point in which we had system modeler, like parts of system modeler written in OCAM, part it, it was still in, in, in Metamodelica. Uh, the people from, from Open Modelica uh, started working on on Metamodelica version two, which uh, which they needed was to fix many of those errors uh, or problems of Metamodelica one. But one thing that we didn't like too much it was that the new uh, Metamodelica had too many imperative features, and and they were using it in order to to speed up the the execution of, of the compiler. So the the code started. Uh, uh, in the code start, they started popping up mutability pieces everywhere and those make, make it a little bit more complicated to analyze the error paths. And yeah, it was harder to analyze and optimize. So we, take, we took the decision that we, that we were going to convert everything into OCaml. And since we already had the tools, we just run the converter again and we ended up with this new uh, system model kernel, which is 99% uh, written in OCAM, a little bit of C++. And uh, I mean, it was practically 510,000 lines of Metamodelica when were converted to 220 lines of OCAM, which was a reduction of 
about 43%. And yes, in the stage, the, the stage the, that we are now is we are replacing the open Modelica frontend that we converted into a new one, which is written from scratch in idiomatic OCaml. And we're now that we know better OCaml, we're taking advantage of many of the nice features that are available in the language. Yeah, as a conclusion, uh, yeah, OCaml really helped us unleash the real functional world of programming in, inside System Modeler. And we got performance improvements that went from 2x to 10x. Uh, the resulting code is, is easier to read than before. And the features uh, of OCaml, like the static typing and, and all the integrated warnings, have helped us to fix bugs, uh, to find and fix bugs, and focus our testing efforts uh, in a different way because we don't need to test. Uh, every tiny function, but we can create uh, some kind of testing that, that, that are a little bit larger, that test a feature just as the user will uh, experience it. And the most important is that before we started using OCAM, fixing a problem uh, in the compiler took us from some days up to weeks, and nowadays, just using OCAM, it takes it can take us from a few hours to two days. So uh, our development process is much much faster. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have questions, uh, just let me know. Yes, thank you very much, Leonardo. Very good presentation. Really like it. I actually have one question here from uh, from a guy in the chat. Uh, from a viewer. Um, <clears throat> can you expand on the OCaml functors? Yes, so I mean, you, you know that in functional programming that you can, having a function, you can uh, make it more complex by passing another function, right? So in OCaml, you have uh, modules, which are basically packages of functions, and you can uh, parameterize them by passing another another module. The most common case uh, is, for example, making a, a map or a map, uh, a, a tree map or a, a data structure like that, mm -hmm. in which you write your code. But the data type that you put, it, that you put in uh, can be different. Uh, so in order to create a concrete map, for example, a map of the strings, you pass the, the module corresponding to, to the strings. And, and that, expo that exposes uh, what's your data and also what comparison function to use. So if, yep. if you want to, to have a, like a different data type, you just pass another, another module. And that's basically the outcome functors. OK, thanks. One more question. There is a question. One guy wonders if you have um, tried to do the, the benchmarking again with the new uh, .NET uh, Core 6 version. No, I actually short. haven't. No. When I when I was preparing this presentation, I, I was thinking I, I should I should run all the benchmarks <laughs> to see <laughs> yeah, how, exactly. how they, they stand in twenty twenty one. Yeah, yeah I, I I will do it uh, at yeah. some point. Is the I had another question. I mean, I I really like your benchmark because I think that's really important to look both look at the speed, but also like what what's kind of you know the development experience or the developer experience when coding in a certain language. I mean, about lines of code and et cetera. Is this open source in any way, or is this like you kept it for yourself? Or have you put it on a public repo somewhere? No, actually, I actually didn't publish it at all. Uh, no? It's, uh, I, I'm going to check if I can, if I can uh, uh, document it a little bit hmm? and, and publish it. Yeah, that would be very interesting. Uh, I guess there's a lot of people. I mean, benchmarking is always interesting. There's always different features for different languages. Sometimes you just need right. speed. Sometimes you want less code. And yeah, there's all sorts of things. I, I think you made a really good, um, what do you call it, a case for why you choose a camel. It seems to really, <laughs> really nice, actually. Mm -hmm. You went through, yeah, it was, it was really nice. Uh, oh, yeah, one more question. Um, if you would do this now, would you consider Yulia as a Yulia as a programming language instead? Uh, I, 
Yes, I mean, I was uh, uh, as well when I was present when I was preparing for this presentation. I was thinking, yeah, probably Julia and Rust would be nice to include in the, in the mm. benchmark to see how they stand. Mm. But probably not Julia, because uh, I really like uh, as if I understand correctly, Julia is 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 a dynamic typing language, and we do rely a lot on the on the data types. So yep. probably not Julia, most probably Rust. Okay. Thanks. I have, I have one more question. Um, what was hardest to do this conversion? Keeping the comments. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so yeah, you're like, you converted uh, how to keep the comments and figure out this is comment and this is code and... Yeah, this is comment and this this goes into this line and, it, and in the resulting code it needs to be attached into this place okay because you don't want a comment that says like do not remove this line of code and ends up being in another line <laughs> some stuff like that <laughs> no total confusing is that then when you read yeah. it like oh this doesn't match at all <laughs> yeah it is probably the yes. hardest part comments yeah again oh uh oh yeah how long did it take and how many persons whole... worked on it? Yeah, the, to to do the switch to OCaml. And it, it was it was a process. I think that we did it in two two or three versions that we of releasing a system model. So it probably would be it was like a one year and a half. But we did it in a very safe way, as mm -hmm. as I as I showed. So we started with first just converting the code to see how it looks, starting fixing bugs, preparing. Mm -hmm. The original code in order to, to be uh, readable. Then we did this uh, like this small uh, tra transitioning as a small part of the code, see, seeing that the technology works fine, mm -hmm. it's changing data, that there is no uh, corruption, no. Uh, and then, yeah, so it was like probably one from one year and a half to two years. Uh, gradually doing it. Yeah. How many people were you? Were you on your own or? No, no. It was me and uh, and the the person that helped me the most. It was uh, uh, Carl and another another developer. Yeah. Has it been worth it from a business perspective to do this? Have you increased speed or quality or? Yeah, I mean, the, definitely the the productivity is is much much better. As I mentioned before, it, it, it could take weeks to find a bug. Mm. And now it's, it is quite easy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. It's just a few hours. <laughs> <laughs> Good. It's nice. Yes. Again, thank you very much, Leonardo. And thanks for your presentation. And thank, great having you with us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome.